Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Hey, welcome to the Acts 6 podcast as we are going through the key chapters in the Bible. This key chapters podcast is going from Genesis to Revelation, looking at all of the key chapters so that we can get a better understanding of the overall message of God's Word to us. Today we're going to Acts chapter 6, a chapter that is often considered the foundation of the office of deacons. As we go through this chapter, we're going to be looking at what it says and we're going to be drawing some practical applications for life in the church today. But I should mention, in this podcast, as in in this particular episode, we're only going to be focusing on the first half of Acts chapter 6 because the second half introduces us to Stephen, who will be the focus of tomorrow's podcast in Acts chapter 7. So with that, let's dive into Acts 6. So far, we've been working through the book of Acts. We have seen the Holy Spirit take the apostles' message and apply it to the hearts of thousands and thousands of Jewish people. At this point, there may be something like 20,000 Christians in the early church. This was a tremendously exciting time. But whenever there is fast growth in an organization, there is going to be things that need to be worked out along the way. And so today's passage brings up one of those situations and how the Lord used it to guide the leadership into an organizational structure of this new institution that we call the church. Let's start in verse 1. Verse 1 gives us the lowdown of what's going on. In verse 1, it says, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now, what's going on here? Well, verse 1 shows us a few things are going on. First, we mentioned in yesterday's podcast from Acts chapter 5, that there's just this tremendous amount of ministry going on in the early church. People were selling their property and giving it to the apostles to distribute the proceeds for the work of the Lord. And here we're seeing that some of the ministry that was taking place was taking care of widows. And now we can mostly only speculate what's going on here, but at the same time, we can probably surmise that there wasn't going to be much of a social net for these widows. And these widows were those who have left these Jewish communities that they've been a long-standing part of. And, and now they're finding themselves without the ability to care for their basic needs, and the church is stepping in to care for them. And now here we're seeing in Acts chapter 5 that there's really at this point two main groups of widows. There's the Jewish women who were native to the region, and there were the Jewish women who were from somewhere else throughout the Greek empire. These were the Hellenistic widows, it says here in verse 1. That word Hellenistic is related to the Greek word for Greek, Hellenica. And so these are women who seem to be from somewhere else throughout the Greek empire, but now they're living in Jerusalem, and it seems to be that there's a preference being given for the widows of the Jewish local background rather than the women from the, 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 throughout the Greek region. And so you got this preference going on here, this favoritism going on here, and this favoritism is starting to cause a division within the church. Now, we know back in our study from Acts chapter 4, verse 32, that the church at this point was just filled with one heart and one soul. They've been wonderfully unified up till now. But this issue, it was threatening the unity of the church. And so the problem reaches the apostles, and they deal with it in verse 2. And so in verse 2 it says, So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. And so the apostles are gathering together the congregation. They have this giant church meeting. And they establish, here we're seeing, the priority of the word of God. The word of God is priority even in these matters here. And if they were to step in and make sure that everyone was getting their fair share, these apostles would have to have forsaken their calling, which was to be preaching and teaching the word of God. And so they propose a solution in verse 3. In verse 3, they say, Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. And so they asked the congregation to identify these seven wise, godly, impartial men who could take care of this task. The apostles would be putting them in charge. And then in verse 4, they would continue to be devoted to prayer and ministry of the word. And so again, this is just reaffirming the apostles' primary calling. They are called to be men of prayer who are faithfully teaching and explaining the word of God. And since caring for the practical needs of the church family would ultimately detract from that calling, the church should establish a group of leadership who will oversee the physical care of the people. Now let's pause for a moment and consider who these two leadership roles that we're seeing here. We're seeing the apostles who focus on prayer and the word. And then we're seeing, secondly here, this, this group of men who will take care of the practical needs. Now, when we think about this second group of leaders and what they're doing here, 
This seems to be an awful lot like the office of deacons, and, and many would say that it is. The biblical role of deacons is that of a servant of the church. The word deacon meant to wait tables, and the Greek word diakoneo is used in verse 2 when the apostles say they cannot neglect the word of God to serve diakoneo tables. And so the Greek word diakoneo is just an interesting word here. We're not entirely sure about its etymology, but many scholars would say it's from two Greek words, dia meaning through and konia meaning dirt. And therefore, a deacon would be literally one who serves through the dirt, as in serving others. Now, that's interesting because this shows us here that leadership is service, and even service can be leadership. The role of these men was to oversee the distribution of the practical care of the widows, making sure that the care was being distributed equally. And so, although these men were serving, they were really leading, and they were leading by administration and and oversight and care. And not only that, I suspect that their service included coordinating teams of volunteers. When you think about it, at this point, there may be up to 20,000, maybe more Christians at this point. They're going to have hundreds of widows who need to be taken care of. This task would have been way too big for just seven guys. And so these seven guys here probably oversaw teams of people who were taking care of the widows. And that's probably why the apostles told them to nominate seven men. It, It would seem natural to have women doing this task because we're talking about taking care of widows here. And I'm sure that many women did take care of these widows, and they they were the ones who brought the food and made sure they were doing okay. And yet the actual oversight fell to the men, because we know from 1 Timothy 2.12 that that women shouldn't have authority over men. And so ultimately, the final authority rested with these seven men, even as they oversaw the work and the care of these widows. Which then brings us back to the question, are these deacons? Well, we can't say for sure. Uh, We can't say this is actually, literally the office of deacons being carried out here in the church. But we can see these guys are serving, they're diaconeeing, they're, deacon, they're, they're serving as deacons. And no matter what we call these guys, these guys here are the first official leadership in the church beyond the apostles that we have recorded in the book of Acts. Now let's go back to this passage and look at how these guys were appointed. Well, going back to verse 3, the apostles told the people to seek out seven men. Now that word seek out is an intensive form of the Greek word skopio. I love the word skopio. It's just a great word. It's just this word for studying or examining. But the Greek word here is episkopio, which is just an intensive form of even even more of a search. And so the apostles are calling people to really pay attention to this, to really think about who this is and, and really carefully weigh who might be able to take care of this. And the apostles give them these criteria and these qualifications to look for. First, these men would be of good reputation. They had to be respectable and respected by others. Second, they had to be full of the Holy Spirit, as in surrender to him and led by the Holy Spirit, and not by their flesh, not by what their family wanted to do or, or the public opinion, but to be followers of the Lord and led by him. They also were to have wisdom. Now, wisdom in the Old Testament sense, this is just this great word, hokma. It's this idea of skill. It was used for those who've been equipped by God with skills to carry out necessary duties. And so, going back to the situation here in Acts 6, This congregation was to diligently look for and find men who were respected by all sides, who obeyed God rather than anyone else or anything else, who had been equipped by God to carry out the tasks of hands. That's a great list. Even in our days, we just consider who should do this role or that role. Even if it's not an official role, are they respected? Do they obey God? Have they been gifted by him for the skills to do the job? Well, the congregation spends this time doing this episcopio. They examine, they weigh things, and they find seven guys. Now, two of these men bear being just pointed out here. The first one's Philip, and we're going to be seeing him doing the work of evangelism in chapter 8. And the other name I want to point out is Stephen, who's going to be featured throughout tomorrow's podcast as we look at chapter 7, and we look at his message and his martyrdom. These men were clearly respectable. This, this was an unusual group of guys here. Here they are in Scripture, and we're seeing them not only caring for the widows, but also advancing the kingdom of God. This is just a quality group of guys here. All right, so now as we go back to this chapter here, In verse 6, the congregation presents these seven men to the apostles. The apostles pray about the matter. They pray over it, and they conclude that God wants these men to take on this role of overseeing the care of the widows, and so the apostles lay hands on them. Now, what does that mean? Well, laying out of hands just accomplishes several things. First, this is a clear and public declaration that the apostles knew what these men were doing and approved of what they were doing and were commissioning them for the task. This is also a way of identifying themselves with the work of these seven men. In the Old Testament, uh, people would lay their hands on a sacrifice prior to offering to the Lord, and that was just a way of saying that this animal represented them. 
And so here we're seeing that the apostles are saying, these men represent us and the work they're doing, it's as if we're doing it through them. Now with these pictures in mind, the Old Testament also used laying out of hands to appoint a person to an actual office. Moses did that with Joshua, Numbers 27, 22, and 23, when when Moses appointed Joshua as the new leader of the people of God. There also seems to be, with laying on the hands, just an aspect of transference. For instance, in Acts chapter 8, the Holy Spirit came upon the Samaritans through the laying out of hands, but we'll discuss that in the episode in a couple days. Either way, it's clear here. The apostles are commissioning these men for the work of ministry. And we know that the Lord was in this whole process because we can see his work, the fingerprints of his work in verse 7. Verse 7 says, The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. You see, as God worked through them, his word was spread throughout Jerusalem. More and more people were coming to Christ. Even the priests were looking at what was going on there saying, that's the place where God is working. I want to be a part of that community too. And the priests were joining them as well. And that just shows us that this whole situation with these widows here, it could have been bad, but the Lord ends up using it as something to strengthen the church, to validate their message, and even advance the gospel. So that's Acts chapter 6. This is an important key chapter because it shows us the need for two kinds of leadership among God's people. One, those who are primarily about the word and prayer, and two, those who are primarily about meeting the practical needs of the body. Churches have both needs, and God has appointed two offices to take care of these needs. We also see the general way to appoint the leaders for these practical roles. Now, we're going to see that finding elders is a little bit different, but here we see, at least in the practical areas, the congregation can nominate godly men who will lead the church even as they serve the church. Yet we also see here some key qualifications for any leadership position, even down to something as practical as delivering food to widows. Leaders need to be people who have a solid reputation in the community. They need to obey God and not the opinion of the masses. They need to be completely impartial and treat everyone with equality. And finally, they need to walk by God's wisdom for the task. Now, having said all of this, it is tempting to want to use Acts chapter 6 as a blueprint for all church leadership roles. We need to be careful with doing that. As we mentioned in the beginning of our study in the book of Acts a few days ago, the book of Acts is a transitional book. Much of its content is descriptive in nature, not prescriptive. It's describing what happened. It's not at the same time prescribing that we should do the same thing. In fact, the Lord will continue to clarify exactly how he wants this church to operate, and he'll give us through the letters greater clarity of what we're supposed to do in these kind of situations. We'll see that in a lot more detail when we go to First and Second Timothy and Titus later on in our study. But with all of this, there's one clear takeaway. No matter who is in leadership and no matter what role they have, they all need to be filled with the Holy Spirit with a solid reputation that reflects walking with God, walking by His wisdom, and walking by His grace. Now, may that be the truth of your life and in your church, and we'll leave things there. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. We'll catch up with you tomorrow, and until then, God bless.